Sean. So, Sean, did anybody adopt snorkel? Yeah, yeah, we, we eventually oh, okay. got the dog. So we got the job. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't, I, it's hard to imagine you have all those photos without him getting the job. All right, well, once again, thank you, Sean. Now, our next presenter, I'm going to have to hit the space bar real quick. Bear with me a second. Did you see me stand on the furniture? Okay. Okay. Our next presenter, um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank for creating the flyer that you may or may not have seen. If you've seen us on Facebook, you've seen his little pink sum that he made. If you've seen this piece of paper outside, you've seen his artwork. He is a graphic designer from the Grand Haven area. Um, he works for Concept A Design, who, like about 75% of the people in this room, does about 75% of his stuff with Herman Miller. It's weird, I'd like to curse about Herman Miller, but then we'd have nobody out here. I have no need to. Anyway, I'd like to bring up Jonathan Bergman, if I can see him. Oh, there he is. First, he's got to crawl over everybody. Right? Now, Jonathan's going to talk to us about something very hard to do. We all have little challenges. This one, people might be familiar with how hard it really is. Jonathan. So, four and a half months ago, I smoked my last cigarette. Okay. Uh, not that many smokers, but that's good. Okay, so I'm not up here because I want to tell you the secret to quitting smoking, or really to tell anyone what they should do. I just want to boast a little bit about myself. So I started smoking when I was 16 years old. And no, that's not a giant trench line I have, that is my real hair. Now, when, when I was 16 years old, my life was all about punk rock and getting my older, uh, my friend's older brothers and sisters to buy us alcohol. And at the time, a lot of my family smoked, and a lot of my friends were also starting to smoke. So fast forward 10 years, that's 10 cigarettes a day, 70 a week, 2,100 a month, 25,000 a year, and over 252,000 cigarettes I've smoked in my life. That comes out to over $10,000 I spent on smoking. $10,000, there's a lot I could do with that money. I could buy two pairs of these dipped in gold Nike shoes. That's one pair for me and one pair for my great grandson to take to an antiques roadshow one day. Or I could buy 2,000 Mad Hatters. That might be enough to last Chris Hoy two, a month or two. But instead I, smoke, I spend that on smoking cigarettes. So I asked myself, why didn't I quit? I knew it was gross, I knew it was bad for me, and I knew I was wasting a lot of money on it. Well, did I mention I started smoking when I was 16? I was very stupid, and that stupidity was easy to turn into denial. I didn't think anything bad would ever happen to me smoking. I thought that was something that happened to other people. But over time, my perspective changed. I thought I shouldn't be diving under my car seats looking for change to go buy a pack of cigarettes. I shouldn't have to take a rest after going for a walk. And over time, I went from being a happy smoker to knowing I had to quit, to really wanting to quit. But unfortunately, that created a lot of doubt in myself. I started creating excuses on why I couldn't quit. I'm not strong enough. I'll start tomorrow. I'll start after this pack. Oh, they canceled house. I can't quit today. <laughs> but then I started thinking, what if one day I end up looking like this? <laughs> and I think to myself, what if I wait till too long and it's too late? What if I end up having to use an oxygen, oxygen machine while I sleep like my aunt? Or I can't even walk to the mailbox without being out of my breath like my mother? And so I realized that I have to do something. I can't just keep thinking about quitting. I actually have to take some action. Now, 40% of the actions that we have go through every day are not decisions at all, but habit. This includes brushing your teeth, waking up in the morning, getting dressed, checking your email, driving to work. Charles Duhigg wrote a book called The Power of Habit, and in it he describes habit as a three-step process. A cue, a routine, and a reward. A cue triggers the routine, which for me was smoking, and that always led to a reward, which then reinforced the entire cycle. So for example, after I smoked, 
I always wanted, or after I ate, I always wanted to smoke a cigarette. Now eating made me feel tired, and smoking a cigarette increased my heart rate. So instead, I would go for a walk. In this way, I still didn't feel tired after eating, and I got the same reward. Understanding this process and using it to my advantage is one of the main reasons I was able to quit. I realized that I had to fill that void where I was used to smoking with something different than what I was used to doing. For example, driving to work in the morning, instead of smoking, I would eat almonds and blueberries all the way to work. And this was just to replace the oral fixation I was used to. But that doesn't mean it was easy. When you have a habit for 10 years, it doesn't just go away overnight. You fight it and it fights you back. And that's why I went through what I'm simply calling the six steps, but others might refer to it as the two months where I was rude, distant, and not very fun to be around. So step one, not only have you decided to quit, but you take action. And this is what it looks like, says the internet. You actually have to like break a cigarette, I think, break it down. <laughs> And the great thing about this is it only takes a few minutes to actually make it become action. And you're very proud of yourself for this. So the next thing you do is you go buy an electronic cigarette. <laughs> now, if you've ever seen one of these things, it looks like a spy gadget you get out of a toy catalog. It's got a little glowing light at the end, and it uh, lets out water vapor that mimics smoke. So it's like smoking a laser pointer attached to a box machine. <laughs> So you're definitely going to be the coolest person in the room. <laughs> but eventually you dish the e-cigarette, and you stop looking for shortcuts. And your brain recognizes this, and it is not happy. So you become ill-tempered and rude to everyone around you. So when someone says, hey John, how's it going? You say, what the hell do you want from me? <laughs> and just when you think you're acting normal again, you realize that network of friends you build over the years, you also smoke are no longer there. You can't be around them, you shouldn't be around them. You've been banished from your crowd. But eventually this too passes. This next step's my favorite. So you haven't smoked for a couple months and you're feeling really good about yourself. A little too good, because you think, yeah, I can take on Usain, Usain Bolt. I can take that on in the 100 meter. I can steal the gold. But instead, you're going to order a Domino's pizza, you're going to sit at home and watch back-to-back -back episodes of Team Mom. <laughs> I never did that. That's just an example. <laughs> and finally, there's that glorious moment when you find yourself transported to a peak high above the clouds, and your friend snaps a picture of you with, with your hands up in a celebratory pose. Actually, I don't think this happened, so I was really hoping for it, though. So if I could go back in time, and say something to myself to keep me from smoking, I don't know if there's anything I could say. I think it had more to do with my environment and people around me at the time. But I would like to tell myself that failure is temporary and that you should really get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs>